Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Lanatra, State Representative of the 12th Plymouth District, representing the towns of Kingston, Plimpton, Halifax, and parts of Plymouth, Duxbury, and Middleborough. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Profiles with Kathy Lanatra. Our district is such a unique and diverse place, filled with interesting and inspiring residents working behind the scenes to support their neighbors and community. We are blessed with dynamic programs, events, and services that enrich our lives. I wanted to take time each month to highlight the unsung people, programs, and events that make this district so special. I hope you enjoy these stories as much as I do. On today's episode, I want to introduce you to a very special young woman from the 12th Plymouth District, Alina Mulhern. Alina has spent years passionately working towards a constitutional amendment to allow internationally adopted children to run for president. Only a rising high school junior, Alina is a seasoned veteran when it comes to advocating for a cause that she believes in. I've had the pleasure of meeting with her numerous times, and I hope you find her as inspiring as I have. Welcome, Alina. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, it's so good to see you again. I just saw you a couple days ago. So I'm so glad you, uh, if, I'm I know. so glad you are coming on the show today. And I know your story, because we've discussed it many times, but I'd love you to tell the audience, just start from the beginning, what prompted you with this idea and to go on to this mission? Yeah. So it started when I was eight years old. I uh, was watching the second inauguration of President Obama, and he had this one line in there in his speech where he talked about uh, how a little girl can be anything that she wants to be because she is an American. And that really prompted me to say as an eight-year-old that I wanted to be president of the United States because of that. So my mom had to tell me, like, oh, you can't become president because you weren't born in America. And my first reaction was, this isn't fair and it needs mm -hmm. to change. So I went to my second grade class and I wrote a little petition, which wouldn't do much as I would later learn, but <laughs> I wrote a little petition and had my entire second grade class sign it. Um, including my entire grade and the principal at the time. And then I got everyone else I knew, who, uh, everyone else I knew, like my aunts, my uncles, friends, my mom's friends. And then I sent it off to President Obama. Um, and I got a response. Not much came of it. It was kind of just a dear student letter, like, you have great ideas, keep up the good work, and yeah. someday you'll achieve great things. And I was so excited because I was like nine and I had just received a letter from President Obama. And I was like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Um, but then like a week later, my mom was like, D so did it actually change anything? And I had to run back into my room, read through the letter again. And I was like, well, I don't think it did. So, uh, then we went to a birthday party for one of my cousins, uh, Josh Cutler, he's my uncle. And he had this great idea that maybe we can file a bill in the Massachusetts uh, legislator, leg legislature. And basically it would urge, like asking uh, the Massachusetts State House to urge Congress to take uh, action on the uh, constitution um, so that went into the Massachusetts State House. And around 10, I testified um, to ask them in front of the uh, Committee of Veterans of Federal Affairs. And that was to, the Gardner Museum, um, too, with the Gardner Hall, right? That you testified was. in, which is the huge yeah. hall there at the State House. So it must have been a little intimidating, especially at how old were you? 10 at that time? I was 10, yeah. It was a little scary, I but bet. like I had practiced it so much that I was, mm -hmm. yeah, it was kind of, I knew what to say and I had like, I was just like, gotta read the thing, but like also look up at the same time to make eye contact. <laughs> um, 
but it was it was a really good experience uh it was fun after and before and then uh, i can't tell you what i felt during it because i don't exactly remember it but it was wonderful either way and then from um, there you i know that so after that oh no go ahead we're from there Sorry, you finish your story i don't want to interrupt okay um so after i did that um I, my mom had reached out to different people to ask them to cover the, my story. And one of the people who she reached out to was Ken McLeod at, um, WGB. Yeah. Um, and he, we got covered and then it got to AP news, which went all over the place. And, uh, then I, got interviewed by Steve Hartman on the road. Um, at, yeah. And then uh, after that, I got interviewed by the Today Show and there were smaller, like more local interviews in between that. And this was all within like a two year period. So from the ages of like 10 to like 12. So, and then I had to take like a brief pause in 2016 because there were so many different issues that the country was working through at the time. Um, but I'm excited to kind of get back going again. Well, I'm excited that you're get back going again too. And they uh, were able to meet with us today, even though it's Zoom, but next time you come in, we'll have you in the studio because I hope we're <laughs> opening up the studio sometime soon. So tell me, was it all positive that you received from this or did you receive some negative? What was the feedback from the public about this? Yeah, um, most of it was positive there are always going to be like negative comments in between and like not so nice things that are said, but that's kind of just how everything works now. Um, but most of the responses were positive. Uh, I've received bit, uh, multiple messages from Instagram and different websites um, of other international adoptees who are super interested in this issue and who were also as passionate as I was. Um, so that was great. Uh, I have received a couple of like, well, just one per se that was like, yeah, you know, you'll never be president. Right. And I was like, well, yeah, I'm trying to change that so I can. So. And did that motivate you even more? Yeah. Um, it was more recently, like two years ago at this point, I think. And I was just like, uh, I don't know why you would reach out to me to tell me that I'll never be president because like, I know that there's a law that, that stops me from being president. So like, <laughs> it's nothing new, <laughs> but yeah. So you've had to learn at a very young age how to speak in public in front of many, many people, how to deal with criticism. I mean, you've learned a lot since the tender age of eight. <laughs> yeah. I'd say so. I mean, the public speaking part has definitely helped me later. Like, I'm not really that afraid of most things, like, especially when it comes to talking in public, uh, because I've been doing it for so long. Um, but yeah, I think that this president thing has really taught me um, super important, like, life lessons to continue to work on things that I'm passionate about, to continue to research things and to be educated. It's also led me to my current interests of international politics. Um, but I'm really glad that eight-year-old me had this wonderful idea because I probably wouldn't be in the same place as I am today. That's true. And you've met so many, as you said, met so many internationally adopted um, students or young people too that have reached out to you. You did mention that you didn't realize you could get private messages on Pinterest the last time we spoke. So we should let everybody know that has a Pinterest account that you can get a private message. How do you find that, Helena? Did it just pop up or? Yeah, I mean, I was on Pinterest because I was just like going to look through something that I don't even remember what I was going to look for, but it was like this little like message, uh, red dot. And I was like, okay, I don't get a lot of notifications from Pinterest. So I opened that up and I was like, okay, there is a messaging system on Pinterest. I guess that's, how it works and I felt so bad because I responded to this girl like six or seven months later because I just didn't realize I could receive messages on it. I know I so I went home after you told me that I went home to make sure that I didn't have any messages from years ago on Pinterest as well 
I didn't realize you'd get them on Instagram either. So I did have a couple that were a year old on Instagram, which was funny. So for these young yeah. people that you've met um, that are also internationally adopted, have you organized? Have you, do you keep in touch? Are you thinking of starting a group? Yeah. So we're all, uh, we all have a group chat. Uh, everyone that like we reach out to and we have a group chat where we're trying to like figure stuff out. Um, uh, so I'm trying to start an organization. I'm in the very beginning of it and it's going to be called International Adoptees for President or IAFP. And I plan to have some of the girls that I've been talking to about this issue uh, on the board so that we can advocate for this issue where um, we can finally have international adoptees to run for president because we can do most other things like run for Senate, run for the Senate and a lot of other, we can hold a lot of other government positions, but we can't run for president. So we're all really just interested in the political scale. And I think it would be a wonderful time and they would be super excited to finally have something to like support like because we've all talked about this um on a grander scheme we're all really supportive of this issue but there's never been like one thing to support behind and i think that it'll be a lot easier to get the word out if we have one thing for people to like find all the information instead of going to like individual people that are interested so yeah i mean that's getting started and i hope it will have a website soon we're working on the smaller details of it. Um, so yeah, that's in the work works and we're still trying to find time because all of us are like super busy. So it's hard to like connect sometimes. So we're just trying to find the time to talk again. Especially during the summer where you're involved in other activities too. I'm sure it's hard to keep in touch, but now that we have social media and a website will be very helpful for others to contact you as well. So out of the United States, do you have any idea of the number of children um, around your age that have been internationally adopted that this would affect? Huh. Um, I'm unsure of the exact number, but there were a large amount of internationally adopted children from the reign, like the years 1990 to like mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a large population of uh, people becoming adults or who already are adults um, who are internationally adopted. So it's definitely, um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure about the number, but there's a, a good amount of uh, people who are adopted that I know of. I know that most of the adoption groups that we were adopted together stay in touch and everything. So um, yeah. That's nice. That's right, so you all stay in touch. So other questions, so many yeah. questions. So let's talk about, I mean, when you hear this on the surface, many of us say, well, well, that's crazy. Why couldn't she run for president? What are people saying that aren't positive? Like, What is the opposition that you're hearing? Why do you think that someone would not want this changed in the Constitution? Yeah. So the original reason that it was put in the constitution was because we were, we had just fought the British for our own, uh, the right to have our own government. So we were worried about other people from other places trying to take over our own government. Um, so we didn't want to have the people from other uh, countries to have the highest position in the American government. Um, but now, since there have been so many, there's been immigration and then there's been international adoption, which that's also another thing that I, you hear a lot. It's making it an, an um, people relate international adoption to immigration, which isn't true because most international adoptees have uh, gotten their citizenship through something called the Child Citizenship Act of 2000 which basically your parents have to meet a certain standard, which one of the standards is both parents have to go over to the country that they're adopting from and they have to fill out paperwork for both of the governments. And then for my case, the moment my feet touched American soil, I was automatically considered uh, 
a U.S. citizen. So that was implemented to make adoption easier and for uh, those who were adopted to get that citizenship right away. Um, I know it was like harder for like my sister, the whole process wasn't in place by the time she was adopted. So my mom still had to go through getting like the longer way of getting the citizenship for her. But the relation between immigration and adoption is a little different because um, immigration, there's not always people who already live in the United States while when you're adopted, your parents are already from the United States. They already have their citizenship. They've grown up in the United States. Um, so they're obviously going to raise their children with the more uh, American view of the world while, which that sounds odd to say, but uh, when you talk about it in terms of like the government, you probably, a lot of people are worried about bringing in different ideas from other countries and like they definitely fear um, the other uh, different countries like uh, taking over with their ideas in the American government. Um, so yeah, the connection between immigration and international adoption is definitely something that we found backlash with. Um, another thing was is just that people just don't think that it needs to be changed because they don't necessarily see a problem with it. Um, it's just some people think that the Constitution should just stay the same or you should just interpret the Constitution the way that the Founding Fathers wrote it. So that kind of covers the uh, kind of three main backlashes or hesitancies to changing this law. I'm sure. So it sounds like, you know, we have international adoption and immigration. We discussed that before. They're really two separate things. One really doesn't have to do with the other because they are two separate things. So I'm glad you clarified that. So I have a question, another question for you. So I run across many young people that will call me or write to me or email me that want to make a difference, but they don't think that they can because they're so young. And here you started all of this at the age of eight. So what advice would you have for some of these younger people that contact me that want to make a difference? How can they get started? Um, I think the main thing that you can do is definitely just learn all that you can about what you're interested in making a difference for. Um, find people who support the same things that you're passionate about and create ideas and kind of just, even if you think that the ideas won't work. I mean, I wrote a petition to the president and it didn't work uh, because that's not the way that the government works. You're allowed to make mistakes, even if um, you think that you're not. You're allowed to make mistakes through your process of learning. And that's you're, if you're young like that, you're going to make mistakes. I mean, I've made countless mistakes. Um, but yeah, definitely just get your hands dirty in the topics that you're interested in and kind of just try to find people who can help you find other people to support and just I think talking with just your parents, talking with other students around you is also insanely helpful. Like my mom definitely helped me a lot when I was trying to figure this out. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to share your ideas because you never know what will come of them. That's such great advice. And you know, even adults, we make mistakes all the time, but I think that's how we learn. If we don't, you can't be afraid to make a mistake because I don't think you will move forward if you do. And if you always want to be moving forward, you're bound to make mistakes, but we just learn from them. That's what I try to tell my children all the time. That you can't, being a perfectionist is really, really challenging because you're so afraid to make an error. But that's how we learn. And look at how much you've learned in this short amount of time. Yeah. So you're interested in international <laughs> politics, international business. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so more like international relations, kind of how the international system works. Um, I recently took a course at American University called Culture, Conflict, and Cooperation. And um, I think that was awesome because we learned about the different theories in international relations, how people will look at the international system and kind of 
dissect what happened, why it happened, and through like different lenses. So like you can look at the international system through the theories of power, or you can look at it through the theories, the feminist theories. And there's just so much in there, which I just, I'm just so intrigued by it. That sounds, I'd like to learn more about the feminist theory. We'll have to discuss that offline sometime. That sounds like a great class. Did you take that course over the summer? I did. I took it in July for three weeks. So along with all my other busy schedule, I carved out time for that. Wow. Wow. That's ambitious. That's very ambitious, Alina. That's wonderful. (laughs) So any last advice? I know you gave advice that to keep talking to our young people, keep talking, keep talking to people, but I'm going to throw in all you can you don't have to write to the president. You could write to your local state representative. And I would be happy to help anyone with any of their ideas or just even talk them through them um, or find them a person that is interested in that or has more knowledge than I do because there's many of them out there uh, and introduce them. So introductions, I think, are very important. And when I hear from young people about you, I'm going to make that introduction as well. I hope you don't mind because I think you're fabulous and amazing. Of and course. So inspirational, so inspirational to not only younger people, but um, older people alike. And I really appreciate that you're with us today. So what are your next steps? Tell me the next steps. Okay. Oh, um, definitely getting this organization kickstarted. It would be such a asset to have this organization. And the next couple of steps would probably be um, reaching out to federal legislators because this is a federal issue and you can't do much on the state level. So it's just finding time to talk with federal legislators and see what we can do, um, see what we can achieve there, what our, and then we kind of need to figure out what our course of action from them would be. because this is there's two ways that you can look at this issue you can look at it as the constitutional amendment part where you amend the constitution to say that you don't have to be a natural born uh, citizen to run for president of the united states or you can amend the child citizenship act of 2000 to have a clause in there that say would say that um this uh, if your parents meet this then you can be considered a natural born citizen and, and run for president potentially. Uh, so we're trying to figure out which one would we would need to follow. Um, it's still, we've been talking about this for a while, but it's uh, still questionable which course that we're going to take. But definitely talk to the federal legislators, um, get their opinion on which way we should go. Um, and then after that, I think it's definitely uh finding other people who are also interested in this uh if you are if anyone who's watching this is interested in it please reach out to me uh through like instagram i mean pinterest now that we know that now that we know pinterest has <laughs> messaging yeah um but yeah i think it's definitely talking to federal legislators and then figuring out which two of the courses we want to take and then finding other people who are just as interested in this issue as I am. I think that's great. We did just, I wanted to touch on, we did talk about um, which way to go. And we also talked about an age too, uh, the age of adoption, maybe keeping it to under the age of two or um, keeping it at a younger age. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I was adopted from China when I was 10 months old and my sister was adopted when she was nine months old. Um, so when, as we grow up in America, we don't really remember anything about China. It's kind of just all that we remember is America. So the whole thing about keeping an age limit would probably be around the time the memory would start to develop because, um, like three or four probably as before three or four most people don't really remember anything um but you kind of it would probably be an age limit just so that it would be more selective um so 
um, other influences that people are hesitant about wouldn't be considered and stuff like that. That's great. I think it was important to bring that up because it kind of narrows it a little bit. If someone was adopted at, say, the age of 16, I could see pushback on that possibly. But you're thinking we don't really have a memory of our childhood before the age of three or four um, or even, you know, maybe some of us, six or seven. But, you know, it depends. But I think that's important to bring up that age. So thank you. Any last advice for yeah. any young people? Oh, I don't know. I think the main thing is just, you just develop your own interests and figure out your passions. And then you can go anywhere after you figure out what you love. Cause you don't want to go and follow something that you don't love. So find something that you love and learn all about it and see what you can do inside of that one interest. Great advice. Great advice. Thank you for joining us today, Alina. And thank you for all your work in advocating for internationally adopted children. Your dedication and passion for this cause is inspirational. You're an example of how young people can affect change and inspire others to do the same. Keep up that great work and I look forward to seeing all that you accomplish. We'll be right back with State House Minute. On each episode of Profiles, I like to take a minute to take my constituents out of the 12th Plymouth District and provide a quick update of what is going on up on Beacon Hill. I have heard from many of my constituents about their concerns for the upcoming school year. I want to provide an update of the current guidance for our schools. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, or DESE, has released their guidance for the upcoming school year. As was said in their May update, DESE requires all school districts to be in person five days a week. DESE is recommending that students in kindergarten through sixth grade wear masks indoors, except for those that cannot do so due to medical or behavioral needs. They are also recommending that unvaccinated staff, unvaccinated students grades seven and above, and unvaccinated visitors wear masks inside schools. Districts and schools are highly encouraged to continue providing robust COVID testing in schools. This guidance is up to date as of the taping of this show. As always, this guidance is subject to change as DESE reviews new data and medical advice and guidance is updated. I would like to take a minute to urge all of my constituents who have yet to do so to go out and get vaccinated as soon as possible. The COVID-19 vaccinations are safe, effective, effective and are a solution to ensuring that we do not regress to where we were last spring and winter. Cases are sadly on the rise again, and the Delta variant is rapidly spreading throughout so many communities. We all have a part to play, and the easiest way we can protect ourselves, our loved ones, and end the tremendous loss of life we, life we have seen over the past year is by getting the shot. There is no reason not to get the COVID vaccine at this point, so please, please go out and get your vaccine. I want to thank Alina for joining us today to talk about your story and sharing with us your passion and your commitment. Your activism is inspiring and I hope our other young viewers learn something about how you can share your voice and work towards meaningful change. Thanks for watching and I hope you'll join us next month for Profiles with myself, Kathy Lenatra.